Hello, welcome to Kafaro.tv. Uh, welcome to the show Unpacked. And today we are honored to have Ambassador Deborah Malik from the USA Embassy. And I still can't believe you're here, but we're so <laughs> ecstatic to have you. Um, basically, I'm just here to have a chat and know all about you. Uh, we've briefly discussed about uh, the demographics of our country and our population. But I want to start off by first asking you, um, you're in a powerful position at the moment, um, a male-dominated area, and you've worked in this area, you know, the Department of State since about 1981. I really have to find out how have you kept it so consistently that you've not fallen off the wagon, number one. <laughs> and uh, secondly, as a young girl, did you ever envision that this is what you do? Well, first of all, Angie, thank you for inviting me today. I'm really happy to be here and uh, very excited about the possibility of having a bit of a conversation with you and hopefully with a number of viewers out there. Um, I, I look for all kinds of opportunities to spend time with young people, which, as you know, are 80 percent of the population uh, yes. here. So it's easy to do in a way, but yeah. also quite, quite difficult yes, yes. to be able to find a platform and a way to really interact with them. Yeah. Um, as for me and where, you know, where I am now, did I envision that I would be doing what I'm doing? Yes. Absolutely not. Um, now, it was always a given in my household as a young girl mm -hmm. that even though I was the only girl, I had two brothers, that of course I would go to university, that I would get an education. Right. That was never a question. Okay. But what I would do afterwards was, off, was very much an open book. Oh. Um, so I went through many different things over the years. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be an archaeologist and dig up, you know, dig up old fossils and everything. <laughs> um, I wanted to travel the world. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a scientist. And in fact, when I went to university, mm -hmm. I uh, planned to become a microbiologist. Oh to uh, spend my time in a laboratory looking at bugs. <laughs> um, uh, somewhere along the line, the other thing I did know I wanted to do was travel and to mm. experience other parts of the world. Okay. It was something that my parents instilled in me mm. as a young girl was the sense of a broader world right. um, and the excitement and curiosity about what and how other people lived. So while I was at university, I somewhere along the line decided that perhaps science really wasn't my calling, okay. although I was interested in it. Right. Um, and instead, I wanted to find something that would allow me to, to live in different places mm -hmm. uh, and have different kinds of experiences. What that meant, right. I wasn't really sure. Okay. Um, I joined the Foreign Service uh, without really knowing what I was, I was getting myself into. into. Yeah. Um, but uh, and never intending to, to spend 30, you know, three decades or more working in this field. Okay. Um, but uh, two things happened. One, when I joined the State Department, mm. um, they sent me to Africa. So my first assignment was in Cameroon. Okay. And uh, I met some very wonderful and exciting and interesting people in a very new environment, mm. a, a part of the world I knew nothing about before I came. Okay. Um, and I was hooked uh, in terms of the potential and the passion right. and the energy yeah. of, of the people, in that case, in Cameroon, mm. who faced so many, so many challenges, right. but yet... Um, they maintained a positive be, yeah, outlook to, yeah. of, and hope for the future, right. which to me was quite infectious. So that was one thing that happened. And the other thing that happened is that I discovered that I liked uh, the opportunity that working in, in our diplomatic service yes. offered to move from place to place mm. every two to three yeah. or four years okay. to have maybe the work was similar, mm -hmm. but the people with were whom different. I was working yeah. were, different, yeah. was, were different and the challenges were different. Um, and so at some point, you know, I looked back and suddenly I had been doing this for a very long time. Wow. Uh, not always e an easy task yeah. um, because we were, women were very much in the minority in mm. this field. Yeah. Um, and we had to work twice as hard to <laughs> prove that we were just as capable yes. or just as good at what, as what we did. But I had also been raised to believe by, uh, by my parents mm. that if you just do your job yeah. and you do it well and you expect high, you set high I standards for yourself, yourself yeah. um, that eventually you will receive, you know, that that will be recognized and it will pay dividends. Absolutely. And so 
with a little bit of luck, some skill. And hard work. Uh, and, hard, and a lot of hard yes. work. Um, I've ended up where I am now, which is uh, the privilege and honor to, to represent my country and my right. government overseas as a U.S. ambassador right. for the second time. Yes. Uh, never imagined in my life <laughs> that it would happen. Even when I joined the State Department in 1981, yes. I never, never expected to go this far. Amazing. Uh, you've brought up an, a, a subject which we are still struggling with, which is uh, women not being considered as equal as men. Mm -hmm. um, when you were at Zimba, what I was talking about, when, you, uh, when it, you said your speech and you said that an average Ugandan is a 14-year-old girl mm -hmm. living in a family of six and will likely drop out of school before high school mm -hmm. with a one in four chance of being pregnant. We've actually also recognized, because at Kafero Foundation, obviously, we're doing uh, the Google Digital Skills Training. Right. We are we're in partnership with Centum to train 25, uh, 10 million youths across 25 countries in the next five years. But we see it, you know, when you go maybe to train in a technical school, you might find two girls. And as Kafero Foundation, we said, no, we can't do that. We mm -hmm. have to start working on programs that, you know, in include just about everybody. So. I also looked at some of the programs that you offer, and um, even just nationwide entrepreneurship and everything, but I realize it's done at a much later stage. Mm. Uh, maybe someone goes to high school, then they're like, okay, let me go to vocational or after university. But then we realize that 50% of our nation is actually under the age of 15, so we're actually neglecting mm. the future. And so we, as Kafero Foundation, um, have said we want to start going into schools. And uh, we're also working with um, Global Peace Foundation, who are also teaching about creativity and character, which is very, very crucial, mm -hmm. especially in the day of automation. Would the U.S. mission consider partnering with, with, with young organizations like this? Because it seems a little hard to get to the top, because I think you know that there's that generation barrier, which we call Generation Z, Y, baby boomers. <laughs> and uh, it was shocking to me to realize that uh, most of maybe CEOs who are over 65 are only 2%, and then mm -hmm. 55 and above is 2%. And then under the age of 30, it's 80%. And yet they're not getting the skills they need. Mm -hmm. Would the mission consider working with young people or young organizations that want to go at a lower age? Because we know even like from age one to four is very important. A child. Well, I, certainly we wouldn't. We would agree that uh, there are very many, very critical, informative stages in the lifetime of a of an individual. Mm -hmm. Our challenge, of course, is not being able to do everything, mm -hmm. um, and so we don't have you know limitless resources. Right. And so, really trying to identify where we can make a difference or mm -hmm. where we can have an impact, right. and really bring some value added is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. There's always much more that we could do. Right. Uh, a lot more we'd like to do but our ability to do it and mm -hmm. deliver a quality program is always the challenge yes. um, so uh, at, while we we target youth mm -hmm. and we're very we are quite liberal in the definition of what that means right. um, but uh, the reality is is that much of it happens at sort of at least secondary school and above yes. but not always mm -hmm. because sometimes we do have opportunities we have partners mm -hmm. who offer us uh, who, who come forward and re, you know to apply for a grant right. or to make a suggestion about a particular program mm -hmm. that uh, as long as it fits into sort of our overall objectives right. which are to provide opportunities to introduce uh, to young people to do entrepreneurship training, right. leadership training. Right. We are doing some, we've done some uh, coding uh, for, for girls, for oh. example. We have uh, done some other sorts of STEM activities yes. with a slightly younger age group. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the challenge is we can't do everything. everything yes. And so it becomes very, very difficult for us to, to be in every, every age area. segment. Yes. Um, but we are quite focused uh, in the mission mm. about how all of our programming, whatever it is, whether it's in health or education or in uh, entrepreneurship, how we can create a better environment and touch the life of that 14-year-old right, girl. Right, right. Because that's really the center of what we're trying to do because we know if through some of the activities that we have working with Ugandans, uh, and, and in some cases in partnership with the government, but also with all the other partners that mm -hmm. we work with. If we can improve her possibility right. and her potential, yeah. 
even if it's keeping her in school for a year or longer, right. or uh, providing her with a livelihood skill that may actually help her earn an income and help her family mm. or her community, we, Uganda will be better off yes, for that, having yes. made that difference in that one, in that one girl's life. Yeah. Well, you've talked about all the amazing work you do, and um, it, was, it was interesting that I'd speak to just people randomly, just trying to do some research, and you ask them, so what do you know the American Embassy for? And everyone's like, well, to get visas, to get visas. <laughs> but uh, well, I was also quite surprised to see that you actually do have quite a lot going mm -hmm. on. Um, some of the examples, YALI, the mm -hmm. Mandela Fellowship, uh, cultural exchange program, you have the American Center, like mm -hmm. the electronic library, uh, you have educational advising, uh, advisory center, and then the report that you, you brought out, uh, was it 2016? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I found something really interesting on that report when I actually realized that you'd spent about 400, is it million dollars? $800 million, 800 million million, yes. uh, on, on helping Uganda. And uh, myself as a youth, I, I hope somewhere that I've actually felt a service from any of that money donated. Uh, that's the question. When we look as youth and we say, you see a staggering amount of money mm -hmm. that's been spent on half of it almost on health. Mm -hmm. And uh, we recently had some situation in the health sector. Should I say, or can I ask, does the mission have to pass it through a specific channel or you can look at different areas? One of the things that was going through my head is like, for example, most of the grants can be that they're going out to a specific group of people who have come up with a, um, an idea of $50,000. $50, and I'm thinking, is there a way it would be considered where you, instead you take 10 people and divide that sum of money? Well, you asked a couple of very good questions. First, let me say that of the about $800 million that the U.S. government puts into Uganda every year, this yes. money goes to help Ugandans. Mm -hmm. It does not go to the government. Okay. Um, we implement our programs, not just in Uganda, but globally. Okay. Our assistance programs, uh, almost 100%, mm -hmm. are, are implemented through partners. Okay. So through, in some cases, larger partners who then subcontract or mm -hmm. work through smaller community-based organizations because our accountability requirements yeah. for our Congress to account for every, every penny, penny um, is so onerous mm -hmm. that for, unless you're a large organization with some capacity, right. it becomes very difficult. Okay. So uh, we feel very strongly that the vast majority of the money that we put into Uganda yeah. every year actually ends up where it's supposed, supposed to, to be, be right. and providing the benefit that it's supposed to provide. Okay. Now, uh, it manifests or is seen in different ways, mm -hmm. right? In the health sector, where we put the largest share of our money, mm -hmm. a lot of it goes to supporting uh, the fight against HIV AIDS. Right, right. So in actual procurement, for example, of ARV, of mm -hmm. antiretrovirals was, for people yeah. on treatment, but a host of other activities that go on related mm -hmm. to ensuring that Uganda can uh, get control of that yeah. epidemic. Mm -hmm. We do other things like doing training for healthcare workers, yeah. midwives, and doctor, you improving curriculum okay. uh, uh, at medical school in order to help improve the capacity mm -hmm. of the care that Ugandans will receive yeah. uh, from their health care workers. So uh, we, we try to look very carefully at mm -hmm. how we actually ensure that every dollar that we spend yes. actually benefits a Ugandan on mm. the other side. So I hope, I hope that in some way, through one of our many different program mm -hmm. areas, mm. you, ha you have seen or experienced mm. the benefit of this or know someone yeah. who has. So we would encourage people to, to track down our report to the people that yes. we uh, that, that we was published. Created. Yeah. It's online. Uh, that tells a little bit, we wanted to give people a little better feeling and understanding yes. of all the many things that we do here in Uganda. Um, but as for, uh, so I do also encourage folks to, to access the embassy. Yeah. Uh, we aren't just for visas. In fact, we <laughs> prefer not to be known only for visas. Um, our American Center is certainly open our, for Is people. it open to everybody? Because yes. It you mm -hmm. do have a process you have to register so right. that you can get in, but okay. there is, access is available to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have a 
we have numbers constraints because only so many people can, can get in absolutely. there at one time. Mm. Um, but we do also have an education advising office that can provide a lot of good information mm -hmm. to those who may be interested in, in pursuing education opportunities yes. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, can also, you know, advise about uh, the tests and all the kinds of things, put, put you potentially in, in touch with scholarships that may be available. So there are some resources there, and we encourage yeah. people uh, to come and access those if they can. Great. I'm going to see if I can ask some questions here off Facebook okay. and see if uh, we can come up with something. Uh, we are live, so if you want to send in a question quickly, we can uh, get that uh, worked on. Uh, we have someone saying... Uh, Roger Serunjoji, who says, um, I'm Roger, just an inquiry about the cultural mission. Two years now, the proposal for cultural preservation, and we have not heard from the embassy. Oh, <laughs> well, this is an, I, I think he's referring to, we have a, there is a global program okay. called the Ambassador's Fund for a Preservation of Cultural uh, Artifacts. Right. Uh, I don't have the name exactly right, mm. but uh, each year countries look for opportunities where we might be able to get, we can apply mm -hmm. uh, to Washington to try to get funds to, uh, in some cases it's been to rehabilitate a museum, other places is to preserve a historical right. artifact or, uh, and, uh, you know, our challenges were competing with everyone mm. from around the world. Yeah. And so we, we are always looking for opportunity for, for possibilities right. that we can use to submit. Um, unfortunately, not everyone is successful, mm. and uh, there are only a handful that are given out every year. Yeah. But this does bring me to, before you ask another question, on this issue of grants. Yeah. Uh, we have grants of difference. We have grant programs of different sizes. Okay. Um, and so one of the best places to, to sort of get, uh, get information about what might be available is the embassy website mm. or the embassy Facebook page. Right. Our public affairs office, we try to make sure that that information is published when right. opportunities arise. Mm. Sometimes we don't know when they're going to come, so right. people need yeah. to check constantly. constantly. But we do have smaller grants because we know that often the capacity to manage large amounts yes. of money is very difficult. Yes. Um, so uh, again, people should you know there's nothing that says a group can't go together and and apply for a grant right. or individuals for smaller grants. Okay, I think I'll take one more question from Mozira Tony Tonito. He says, what do you think about the demographic dividend? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll be very honest. Mm. I think the, the demographics of Uganda certainly are, are an opportunity, mm -hmm. but they're also very much a challenge. Yes. Um, uh, just as we were talking at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, 80% of the population under the age of 30, 30 half of the population under age 15, yes. and average age, uh, you know, 14 yes. is that, it's a it's very, young. very young yeah. population. Um, and it, it's now, it's not a future problem where people say, oh, oh look, yeah. we know we're going to have this population yes. wave, what it, do we do? Yeah. It's here, it's and, and the ability to adapt and figure out how you ensure that each and every one of those, about a million new Ugandans who are uh, born every yes, year, yes. has the opportunity to reach his or her potential. potential. It's, a, it, it's a challenge. Even for it would be a challenge even for a country like mine, mm. where the economy is much larger, yeah. it's much more robust. Mm -hmm. um, so in an environment like Uganda, where the economy is relatively small compared to other countries, yeah. um, it, it needs to be growing now yes. uh, to ensure that people have the education that they need, that mm. they have access to the kinds of health care that they need, and have the skills that mm. they need to work not in the 20th century, but in the 21st century. Um, and so do we have clear and perfect answers about how that should work? No. no. Um, but what I can tell you why it's an opportunity is because just in the short time, in the two years I've been here, mm -hmm. traveling around and having opportunities to interact with Ugandans, yeah. particularly young Ugandans, I am continually impressed 
by the energy and the passion mm -hmm. and the creativity and the real desire on mm -hmm. the part of Ugandans to be doing something positive yeah. and to contribute not only to their own family mm -hmm. and their own welfare and their but the, the welfare of their communities and ultimately of their country. And to me, it, it's I find it very energizing. Wow. When I get depressed or I get <laughs> tired of all the meetings and the policy discussions yeah. and things that I have to do, I love to have time to spend with just a, even if it's just a small number of young people because they you know they they really re-energize me about you know why it's important the work that we do mm -hmm. in the embassy on behalf not only of the US government but on behalf of Ugandans so that's where the challenge comes yeah. it's a it's a it's a dividend in a way because yes it's more people yeah. and it it creates a larger market and ultimately it could be a very positive thing for the country mm -hmm. but the challenges are ensuring that they're not just a population of people yeah. sitting around mm -hmm. waiting for the government yeah, to, to do help. things yes, for them. Yes. Uh, so it, there are no easy answers. And I think Uganda has a real opportunity in the sense of showing other countries mm -hmm. how you can address this. Yeah. There's one more thing I want to uh, talk to you. Something mentioned the education, 20th century, 21st century. You, as uh, Ambassador Deborah Malik, if you were in charge of any education system globally, is there anything you would change? I probably would not be the person you'd <laughs> want to be and have in charge of the education mm. system. But what I will say is one thing that has come that I think, if I look back over my entire career right. and the places that I have served, um, both mostly in Africa but also in Southeast Asia. Um, I think the one thing that I have really taken to heart is that the importance of education, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, we, and I would say particularly in countries like mine, we may take it for granted that, okay, we're going to go to school, yeah. we're going to, you know, mm -hmm. we'll get a job, we'll do something when we come out. And what I've learned, in, you know, obviously in countries like Uganda and elsewhere, that the way, the, the ultimate key to real success in life, mm -hmm. real success in development right. is education, fundamentally. Yes. Um, because one, it belongs to you. They mm -hmm. can't, no one can, can take, take that it away. away from you. Whatever you, whatever you learn over the course of your lifetime is something that belongs to you and that you can do lots of wonderful things with. But it must be a priority. Um, you can't just pay lip service mm -hmm. to the fact that uh, education is important. Right. It really is fundamental. Uh, to uh, unlocking a, a person's potential. Yeah. Now, obviously, everyone learns differently mm -hmm. and everyone needs a different kind of education. But at the end of the day, it's really about prioritizing mm -hmm. it and sticking with it. If you look at those countries that have been successful, it's because education, education. has been the first driver of that development. Mm. Um, and then the subset of that is keeping girls in school. Um, because it's 50% of your yeah. population in any country. We're very equal. <laughs> um, and, and it's not 50% of the people who finish school. And uh, it's like tying your one hand behind your back and, and trying to one, accomplish yeah, a task. Yeah. You have to have Both. all of the population participating. So I think prioritizing education, particularly girls' education, and not because we don't like the boys. <laughs> um, I have two sons of my own, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yeah. Um, and it's important for them to be part of the process, yes. but we can't leave half the population behind and expect a country to succeed. Okay, let me see if I can uh, find one more yeah. question. And then, uh, in our country, oh, we've talked about education, but uh, hello, I would like to understand more about the yearly Yali program. Mm -hmm. I received a certificate in girls and human rights. How best can I use it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for the Yali program, our Young African Leaders Initiative, Initiative yes. of course, we have a couple of different uh, ways that people can access that program. We have our flagship program, of course, which is the mm -hmm. annual Mandela, Mandela Washington, Washington Fellowship, yes. um, which is a very competitive <laughs> process. And in fact, we are in the process at the moment of reviewing all the applications for the for this coming year. Okay. Um, and that it's a rigorous process because. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of Ugandans who are eager to participate, <laughs> and a lot of very good and talented ones. Yes. Um, uh, so that's we've had about a hundred people so far from Uganda who participated in mm -hmm. that program uh, since it was started. 
Uh, we have, in addition, we have the Yali uh, leadership, Af uh, lead Regional Leadership uh, uh, Center in mm -hmm. Nairobi, okay. which is open to uh, folks from all over this region. Okay. There have been about 100 Ugandans who have applied on their own and gone and participated in programs oh, on great. entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. on leadership. And we would certainly encourage more folks to, to apply. In fact, we hear that Ugandans are the largest number of, of participants oh. in, the, in the in the program there, mm. uh, which just shows that there are a lot of very motivated young people here. Um, and we would encourage you to look into those opportunities. And then we have just sort of a broader YALI network. Right. Um, and we would certainly encourage people to find out how they can connect into that. <laughs> yeah. um, because there's a lot of cross-border uh, yeah. activity and, and trans-global activity that goes, that happens through that network. It's right. really quite amazing to watch. Um, as far as the specifics of how she can put this, uh, he or she can put this yeah. to, to work, um, uh, that's, that's probably beyond my pay grade at the moment, <laughs> but uh, certainly connecting in uh, with others who have ideas, who hear about things, and certainly our website and our, fa our Facebook page is a way to perhaps give them some ideas. Okay. Uh, one question. You've spoken about the, the, the campus in Nairobi, and which is all down to digital or digitization. Mm -hmm. What do you think Uganda will be like if it doesn't get its population uh, skilled with digital skills? <laughs> well, I think it's a challenge for all countries, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and it's particularly hard in, in developing countries where resources are limited. Right. But I think one thing is quite one thing is quite clear to all of us mm -hmm. that technology is is here to stay yeah. and is some is a platform that we need to learn how to exploit yes. better. Um, uh, to provide learning opportunities. Now, whether it's education mm -hmm. in the sort of classic yes. sense, whether it's understanding how to use technology to, uh, <coughs> to improve one's life right. uh, or livelihoods, mm -hmm. that's another piece of it. Um, it's something that has to be incorporated into a curriculum, mm -hmm. I think, now going forward, mm -hmm. uh, expecting that you can only teach people what what we've been learning for the yeah. last 150 years yeah. or in the way in which we've been learning for the last 150 mm -hmm. years versus what needs to happen now um, it would be ridiculous <laughs> and so how uh, how people use that in their environments and how they can use it to, as a tool for good and in fact there's a lot of innovation in Africa right. that's going on mm -hmm. in that regard not just in the creation of apps but but looking at how you can use remote learning, how you can use yeah. this, you know, uh, uh, digital platforms mm -hmm. to be able to expand the opportunities Absolutely. to people. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this was uh, Unpacked with Ambassador Deborah Malik. We discussed just about everything, education, <laughs> digital skilling, entrepreneurship, her past. We really want to thank you for honoring our invitation to come and spend some time with the young people. And we hope to have you back soon. Certainly. Well, thank you again for, uh, for allowing me to come and spend a little time with you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you so much for those who participated, those who sent in your questions. We thank you. But if you want more information about the U.S. mission, please kindly go to their website. You'll be able to find all the information that you need over there. Thank you so much for watching. I was your host, Angela Mirembe. Have a good evening.